front kids and we'll sing our song. church we always read the words of Jesus what did Jesus say the time has come he said the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe the good news all right and so God's kingdom is spreading through all the world Jesus says it's coming closer and closer and closer and at our church we look around I want everyone to look around at the people in our church does everybody here look the same no some people are pretty old. Some people are pretty young. Yeah. Some people are nice and skinny. Some people are very fat like Fred. Ah, ah. No. I swap that around. Strike that. Reverse it. And different colors and different ways of dressing and different ways of singing. All different ways. God's kingdom is for all of us. And we're going to read a little bit. of When you go out to Sunday school this morning, the kids are going to hear the story of Peter a Jewish man, going to visit Cornelius, a Roman man. And they were enemies. They did not like each other at all. Look at these two men in the picture. Are they happy? No, oh, not really. They're sort of frowning at each other. They're not sure. They're not, they're not kissing each other. They're not hugging each other. One of them saying, yeah, come on in. But they're looking at each other a bit suspicious. They're not sure what's going to happen. And you'll hear that story when you go out to Sunday school. We're going to read the very end of it where Peter's going to say something. All right, so we've got some good readers. As I come to you, if you don't want to read, you just say amen, okay? Here we go. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not so favor Favoritism. Favoritism. Good job. But except from every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. You know them. Messiah God sent to the people of Israel. And now the good news of Peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Excellent reading. What grade are you in? One. Grade one. Excellent reading. All right. You know what happened? You know what has happened throughout the province, province of Judah, Judea, beginning in Galilee. After the baptism that John preached. Amen. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. How many people did he heal? I forgot. It says all. All the people, healing all the people. All right. Because God was with him. Very good. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in the Jerusalem. Right. They killed him by hanging him on on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but, but by witnesses whom God had already 
chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Very good. All right. Some excellent reading there. And so Paul Peter is saying it doesn't matter. God loves everybody the same. And he says Jesus healed all the people that he could find. He didn't just pick some people. He healed all the people he could find. And then he says here that everyone. Who is it? Is it someone? Is it just a couple of people? Who is it? Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, what kind of hair you've got, whether you've got hairy feet like me, or whatever, you've got a skinny man like me or a fat man like Fred. Jesus says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And that's good news. So as the kids head out to Sunday school this morning, I would like everybody to get up, find someone to shake by the hand. And the first person say, believe in Jesus. And the other one will say, receive forgiveness. Everybody get up and find someone you haven't greeted this morning. If you see someone who hasn't been shook by the hand, you go and shake them twice as hard. Off you go. We want to welcome this morning uh, George Mutetti who's coming to speak to us. He's been speaking with our African folk uh, since Friday and Saturday and here to present to us this morning as well. So God bless you, George, as you speak to us and we pray that the people listening can understand and hear what God has to say to them. God bless you. Welcome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, just as I've uh, first I said, I'm George Mutetti. I come from Kenya. And uh, I was invited here by Pastor Zebedee and Christopher. And I just want to appreciate so much Pastor David. He wrote a powerful letter that enabled me to get a visa to this place. May God bless you so much. That letter was very powerful. I'm married. Uh, as usual, Africans, we have many children. I have six children, three boys. <laughs> And uh, we are doing very well. I'm a pastor at home. I have a ministry. I also have a school. I run a private school. And uh, we have about 300 children. And we are doing well in Africa. This is my second time to be in Australia. I was here 10 years ago, training uh, in pastoral work in Toowoomba. And I'm back here. And I want to thank God so much for being here with you. Uh, I want to say I've got a few things I feel in my heart so much to, to share. And uh, I love what Paul writes. I love so, in the Old Testament, I love so much David. And in the New Testament, I love Paul. Most of what these people did really challenges me so much. My best book is the book of Ephesians, and uh, I've been teaching it for quite a long time because it has so much that makes me grow and understand many things. Today I'll be able to share about our stand in the Lord, and I will best specifically in the book of Ephesians. As I said, it's one of my best books. Paul, as I said, is one of my best writers. The apostle, of course, sent to the Gentiles. And the first time I encountered the book of Ephesians, it really challenged me, especially chapter 1. Paul is the writer of the book of Ephesians. He wrote the book when he was in prison, and he was writing to the Ephesians whom he had met some years back. And if you want to know how he met the Ephesians, you can get back in the book of Acts of Apostles. Acts of Apostles, chapter 
uh, 20, verse 22, that was the last time Paul met the Ephesians when he was, had been there for three years and he, ha, he gave them the last statement. You can be able to read it from Acts chapter 20. I'll not be able to read it, just be able to paraphrase because my message is in, in Ephesians. He told them the Holy Spirit is compelling me to go to Jerusalem and I have got to live. He had been with them for three years and he goes ahead and says, I'm paraphrasing, he says, but I know what is awaiting me there. Paul had been with the Jerusalem, the Judaism system, so when the Holy Spirit compelled him to go to Jerusalem, he knew what was there because he had been in the system that betrays the church and now that he's going there, there's a lot that is waiting for him and he knew very well he will not be able to see them again and he told them. I believe for those who have done theology, the people who are in that church were the likes of Aquila, the likes of Apollo, and he told them, you will never see me again. And then he told them that, but you leaders, take care of the flock, which was bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is the saddest information you can hear from a person you've been with for three years, that you will never see him again. So he left, compelled. It was not his will. He was compelled not by a man. He was compelled by the Holy Spirit to go, and he knew he would never come back again. So now when he went to Jerusalem, straight away as the Holy Spirit had led him, things turned out as he knew. He was arrested, and if you follow up the story from the Acts of Apostles, he was arrested, and then he was taken to Rome, where he was jailed. Now, eight years after that, that the time somebody called Luticus from the church in Jerusalem, from the church in Ephesus, where he had left them and ceremoniously came and visited him, and he remembered to write this letter of to the Ephesians. Because he saw a messenger who would be able to take this letter to them. Now, this is a letter that is being written to the people he will never see again. If you are given an opportunity to write a message, send a message, ring to somebody you will never see again. And you are a father, you are a mender, you are a coach of that person you know the message you can be able to write to that person. So definitely, this is like, this is the last one. This is the best I can be able to give to these people. That's why I love the letter of Ephesians. Now, we can dive into the letter and begin to see a letter being written to the people you will never see again. Theologians and those people who have studied the book of Ephesians, they say, you can divide that book into two packages. Chapter 1 to chapter 3, you can call it our stand in the Lord. Chapter 4 to chapter 6, you can call it our walk. Because in the normal circumstance, after standing, you walk. So it's helping them to stand by three chapters, and it's helping them to walk with the three chapters. I wish we had all the day we could be able to go through knowing how to stand and then knowing how to walk. Because Jesus was necessary. For these people, he would never see them again. So he has to write to them, helping them to know how they can stand in the law and the Lord in his absence and how they can still walk in the Lord in the absence of their master, their coach, and their mentor. Praise the Lord. So, this is how he begins. The introduction is very powerful. He begins by saying, I, Paul, I, Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, called by God according to his will. It's me writing to you, Ephesians, me, Paul, the one who has been with you, 
I am an apostle, the send one, the missionary to you, not according to my will. Because my will was to destroy the church. And now I laid it down when I was hit and I became blind. Now I only do the will of God. That is to begin to build that which I destroyed. So I am writing to you to build you who initially I was in my will was to destroy you. So that's how it begins. And how does he now write to them to build them? He begins, he continues and says, Praise be to the God of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, blessings. So he wants to build them, the will of God to build them, by telling them that there are certain blessings I want to write to you so that you can be built. I will not be there. You will never see me. But if this letter lands to you, the immediately you get this letter, it is intended to make you stand. It is intended to unfold the spiritual blessing, blessings that you need to have to enable you stand and walk in the Lord. Therefore, what are those spiritual blessings? He has listed several of them in chapter 1, the blessings that can make them stand, the things that if they know and they impress, they will stand in the absence of this great apostle. What are they? The first one is chosen us in Christ. You are chosen in Christ. Paul wants the fishers to know for them to stand in the Lord, they have to know that they are chosen. Peter puts it, that's how he puts it in verse 4. He says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. He says, I want you to know you are the target of God. You are chosen not just to be people ordinary, but to be holy and the blameless. Ephesians, please, take note of that. For you to stand and to walk, you have to know you are special people. You are chosen to be holy. Your destiny is to be holy and blameless. Take that Ephesians. He continued to write. In fact, that message is even backed by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Peter puts it much clearer. He amplifies the chosen, being chosen. He says, you are a royal people. You are priests. You are great people of God. And Paul is backing that by telling the Ephesians, you are special, my sons. I left you. I will not be able to see you again, but I want you to know you are chosen to be holy and to be blameless. You are God's own possession. You belong to God, you Ephesians. Don't let anybody intimidate you. Even in the very situations you are in, whether they are bad, whatever you are passing through, Ephesians, I'm writing to you to tell you, stand, you are chosen people. John backs up that chosen and he says, Jesus, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. That's Jesus saying. He's backing up that being chosen. You, he, we, he chose us. We are royal. We are special. Destined to grow to become holy and blameless. Hallelujah. We are marked by God. He's continuing to write and he continues to give another point that will make them stand. The first point is stand because you are chosen to be holy. You are royal. You are special people. Point two comes in another verse where it says, he predestined us to be adopted to sons. Point two is Ephesians, you have to know, you have been adopted to be sons. Not just chosen, and you be kind, just people, but you've been bought, adopted into the family. Eh? To be adopted is to be made somebody's child in the normal circumstances. So he's saying, number one, you are chosen. Number two, you've been adopted. You are being put in the Roman Empire. When one was adopted in a family, he lost everything in his previous family, 
and gained everything in his now family that he has come in. So Paul is saying that know that when you were chosen, you lost everything in the other family you were in. And now you have everything that belongs to this family. Paul puts it very well again in Romans by saying, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are God's children, then we are coherers with Christ. By goodness. That means what? It means we have been adopted in the family and we have become coherers with Christ. We are chosen and now we become partners, coherers with the cross. That means that which is for Christ now also belongs to us. This was a powerful message that can make anybody stand. So it was not only meant for the Ephesians at that time that are being written on. It is our, me- our, our message also. We are coherers. Jesus said that greater miracles will you be able to do even than this I did. We are coherers in everything that Christ had. Praise the Lord. So, that is point number two. We have been adopted, therefore we are coherers. We we are in a new family, brothers and sisters. A wonderful family. This is the message that can make one stand. Even if you thought you are nothing, it is able to bring you up. Then number three, he adds, which comes up in verse seven, it says, in him we are redeemed through his blood. He says, Ephesians Though you will never see me again, I want to assure you, you are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are chosen. You have been put in a new family, and you are redeemed. To to redeem means to regain something that you had lost. You were once lost in your transgression, but through Christ, you have been brought back, redeemed by his precious blood. Paul put Peter puts it very well in 2 Peter chapter 18. Chapter 2 Peter he says, You know that it was not with the perishable things that silver or gold that you are redeemed with. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's not by silver. Now, somebody was trying, Paul again in 2 Corinthians, on backing that point of redemption. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which I want us to listen very carefully when it comes to redemption, he says, chapter 5, verse 21, he says, God made, he regarded him, Jesus, a sinner who had not known sin, so that in him we can become the righteousness of God. Our redemption, our being brought back, Jesus was made a sinner so that we can become the righteousness of God. Now, there is a business language which is used sometimes, a court language. It is called imputation. There's a term called imputation. Imputation is a term that is used in business and sometimes used in a court. Imputation means to create, to credit something to someone's account or accuse somebody of an offense. So to depute. So imputation means he, Jesus Christ, in the, in the business language, His account was deputed. His account was deputed righteousness, and our account was credited righteousness. Are we together? So Jesus' account was full of righteousness, and therefore it was deputed. It was minus righteousness, and our account, which was full of sin, It was credited in the righteousness of God, and our account, which was full of sin, was deputed. Sin was removed and credited on the account of Jesus Christ. That is the full package of redemption. There is a business transaction that took place. One account that was full of righteousness was emptied and deposited on our account. So we became rich of righteousness, And Jesus became rich of our sin. What an exchange. This is the message Paul is passing across in a letter to the people he will never see again. I'm sure, even if I was to receive that letter for the first time, this will make me stand. Our message is to stand in the Lord by the understanding of who you are in terms of what Jesus did. He chose me. 
He adopted me. I'm in a new family. And now he has done the full transaction of emptying himself of his righteousness and crediting and depositing it on my account that I can have righteousness that was never mine, mine but was given to me by Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. The last thing that is passing across to these people, he says in verse 13, when you believed, you were marked with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Number three, saying, you guys, my sons, Ephesians, you are chosen and you are adopted and you are redeemed. The transaction was done clean. Remember, now he has sealed you. He has sealed you with a seal. A seal, listen, what is a seal? A device used to join two things together, so to prevent them from separating. A seal is that which joins two things together that stops them from being separated. Or it's an emblem or a symbol that is stamped into a document to make it authentic, valid, certified to be true. Wow. So he's telling the Ephesians, you people, you are sealed. You are connected to Jesus Christ. Connected completely, never to be separated. And you are given a seal, just the way a, a, a seal. You are given a seal. You are stamped on to be authentic. You are a true and a certified copy of chosen, adopted, and redeemed children of God sealed. Wow! You are sealed. So, Ephesians, don't worry about anything. You are the certified true copy of God by accepting the redemption, the transaction on the cross of Jesus being emptied of his righteousness so that it can be put on your account. You are a true certified copy of the children of God. Ephesians, I will never see you again, but I want to tell you this can make you stand in the Lord. Hallelujah. And in most cases, seals are usually symbols or even designs of men. But the seal he's saying here is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a person. So it is a seal that speaks, that advocates for you. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, and, and we have the Holy Spirit in us, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. We have a seal that speaks. It's not just a rubber stamp. And then it is there to be seen. It is there to be heard. So the seal we have, which is the Holy Spirit, is not just there to be seen, but it speaks on our behalf. It's Holy Spirit, he speaks in us. He says, Abba, Father. He, te- he keeps on reminding us that you are chosen, that you are adopted, that you are redeemed. You are saved, and you are the children of God. You are the true children of God, the Holy Spirit. So we have a seal that speaks, not just a seal that is there like a design or a sign. Paul was doing that. That is it, brothers and sisters. These are the four things that I've detected. There are more, but I've detected those four. A message to the people Paul will never see again. I call it a life and a death message. What will make them stand, even if they will never see them? And thank God, the message is with us today. He finishes that by a prayer. He says, I pray for you that you may receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him. To understand these things, I'm telling you, he finishes by a prayer, which is in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I pray for you. I know it might be hard to understand that you are chosen through the things you are passing through. You may not be able to know that you are redeemed, you are bought, that the exchange, the deal was done. 
on the cross. You may not be able to understand, but I pray that the Holy Spirit may help you. Your eyes may open and that you may be able to know you are special people. You belong to a new family of God by adoption. You belong to a new, you are sealed. Nothing can move you out of that family. He prayed for them that prayer that you may know the power that raised Jesus from the dead. You may know who you are. He seals up that chapter with that prayer to make them stand. So church, I just want to challenge us to know that we, just like the Ephesians, we can stand. It does not matter what you're passing through. It does not matter the way pastor was saying. Whether black, white, red, green, short, it does not matter. Jesus, Paul, God has helped us to understand through this letter of Ephesians, we can stand. You can stand. You are chosen. You are redeemed. You are adopted. You have a seal. You have a seal, the Holy Spirit, that speaks and tells you, go on. It is possible. You are marked by God. You are moving on to holiness. You will be able to make it. Let's bow down our heads and pray. Oh, Father, we love you. Mm. We are special. Sometimes we may feel we are alone in the journey, but we are never. Sometimes we feel like we are disappointed, discouraged, hopeless, but we are learning that we are special people, chosen, adopted. We are a new family, family of God, Jesus, the choir. We are redeemed. The transaction was a big deal. And here we are, protected by the seal. Mm. Help us to walk with confidence, to face another day, to face another challenge, to move on. Whether we seem to be alone, we, are, we shall never be alone because the Holy Spirit is with us. Father, bless us in this journey as we stand and be able to walk, serving the Lord, doing that which is your will. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you so much.